good afternoon and good evening to all speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to the SNF webinars. The speaker for the first session today is our uh, special guest from United States of America, Professor Gastevo Pradila. Professor Gastevo Pradila is an associate professor of neurosurgery at the Emory University School of Medicine. He served as chief of the uh, neurosurgery services uh, at Grady Memorial Hospital and is the co-director of the Grady Skull Base Surgery Center. Pro uh, Dr. Pradela completed his training in neurosurgery at the John Hopkins Hospital in 2012 and his fellowship training in cerebral vascular and skull based surgery at the University of uh, Miami Miller School of Medicine in 2013. In addition to that, he received postdoctoral research training in the cerebral vascular research and experimental neuro-oncology at the John Hopkins uh, University School of Medicine prior to his residency training. Dr. Padilla is the director of the Cerebral Vascular Research Laboratory for the Department of Neurosurgery and a member of the Emory Brain Research Laboratory. He specializes in the uh, surgery, uh, surgical treatment of the cerebral vascular disorder, including aneurysm, arterial venous malformation, and carotid artery stenosis, as well as in open and endoscopic surgery for skull base and a uh, tumor. His specific and clinical cerebral vascular uh, research uh, focuses on uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, and intracranial aneurysm formation. And his research in skull base surgery focuses on microsurgical uh, anatomy and uh, technique development in the skull based surgery. We are extremely honored to have him uh, today with our, at our webinar, and he'll be talking on a minimally invasive treatment for intracerebral hematoma and the result of enriched uh, trial. The speaker for the second session today is our honored guest from United States of America, Professor Lau Zi. Professor Lau is the medical director of cerebral vascular surgery, Department of Neurosurgery, Houston Methodist Sugarland Hospital, uh, Texas. He is also a representative of the regional neurointerventional radiology at the Houston uh, Methodist uh, System Stroke Physician Leadership Panel. He was a former director of cerebral vascular and skull based surgery University of South, South Florida, Lakeland Division, Lakeland. His clinical and research interests are focused upon the field of cerebral vascular surgery. He's a noted author with several publications in various peer review journal. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar, and he'll be talking about hybrid cerebral vascular surgery, uh, developing specialty within a subspecialty. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from China, Professor Du Zhu Zhu Yin. Professor Du is a consultant at the Department of Neurosurgery, Huasan Hospital of Fudan University, Shanghai Neurosurgery Emergency Center and National Center for Neurological Diseases at Shanghai, China. His area of clinical interest include a traumatic brain injury, hemorrhagic stroke, and neurocritical care. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Gustavo Pradilla. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from United States of America, Professor Sabaresh Natarajan. Uh, Professor Natarajan is currently the director of brain tumor, skull base, and cranial neurosurgery. He is also a consultant in cerebral vascular and surgical neuro-oncology institute at the St. Vincent Healthcare, Jacksonville, uh, Florida. He's a member of AANS, CNS, as well as American Association of South Asia Neurosurgeons. He was being rewarded uh, with several awards and honored for his outstanding contribution to neurosurgery. He's a hybrid trained neurosurgeon and specializes in both clipping as well as coiling for aneurysm. He's also a noted uh, author with several publications in various uh, peer review journals. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor uh, Lau Zi. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome to both speaker and chairs and the wonderful audiences to this online uh, platform of SNF webinar. A warm welcome to our colleague in China. We are extremely thankful to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the wheelchair channel. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online platform to our first chair, Professor Du Zhu Ying. Uh, Professor Du, please. Okay. Thanks for the warm introduction, Dr. Liu. And uh, uh, my greetings from here from Shanghai, uh, my dear friends and colleagues. And today uh, we are very honored to have uh, Dr. Gustavo Pradilla here 
to share with us the experience from the ENRICH trial. So as we all know, uh, in recent years, minimally invasive surgery has become the mainstream treatment for intracerebral hemorrhage and evidence is accumulating. The ENRICH trial is a large RCT with a target enrollment of uh, 300 patients. And it is comparing surgical treatment using the brain pass and mirror system from the uh, Nico company, as far as I know, and uh, uh, versus the conservative treatment in patients with ICH. So I believe the results of the trial is about to be reviewed in the near future. Hopefully it will provide us with solid evidence for the practice of minimally invasive surgery in this situation. So let's welcome Dr. Gustavo Pradida. Thank you very much, Professor Du. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. And as you very correctly mentioned, uh, the ENRICH trial is ongoing and it's about to be completed. And I hope to have some additional data to share, but I know this is an intense area of interest and research in all of Asia and the incidence of this disease worldwide continues to be pretty significant. This is where I'm located. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. It's about a 6 million uh, metro area. And uh, we're part of the Emory University uh, School of Medicine, which is the main academic center for this region. My most important disclosure is that I'm the principal investigator for the ENRICH trial, and that is sponsored by Nico Corporation, and they make the devices that I'm going to be discussing with you. So uh, it is a big problem with a lot of patients, and we spent a lot of money caring for them. And when we look at the overall distribution of disease in the cerebrovascular world, we spend a lot of time talking about hemorrhagic disease and aneurysm treatment, but uh, intracerebral hemorrhage is a pretty substantial part of the pie, about four times the incidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So it needs, needs our attention and the primary causes of intracerebral hemorrhage continue to increase in the population. People are getting older, and they're developing more hypertension, more amyloid angiopathy. And nowadays we have more anticoagulated patients than we've ever had for multiple reasons. For me specifically, this is what we call the map of the stroke belt in the United States. So everything that looks darker, it's a higher incidence. And this is where I am, which what we call the buckle of the stroke belt. So the incidence of this disease is very substantial. So in my mind, there are three important reasons why we should treat intracerebral hemorrhage surgically and remove these blood clots. The first one is control of intracranial pressure. The second one is the prevention of the expansion of the hemorrhage. And the third one is the prevention of secondary inflammation. And I'm gonna go into those uh, one by one. So intracranial pressure becomes substantial when we have a hematoma that's greater than 30 cc's. And of course, we need to improve cerebral perfusion pressure and minimize the injury to the perihematomal area. If we do nothing for the patient's neurological function, but by addressing the hematoma, they can get extubated and out of the ICU faster, we would be putting a significant dent on the number of deaths because about half of the patients with an ICH die from ICU-related complications, pneumonias, DVTs, PEs, et cetera. So it would be an important thing to treat that intracranial pressure. Uh, prevention of the clot expansion is an important problem. We have a lot of data from uh, the group at Mass General and others on the spot sign, having active contrast extravasation during the CT angiogram. And we know that this happens commonly. Patients present with a smaller hemorrhage, and if we don't control their blood pressure and address the bleeding source, they're going to progress. And that happens quite frequently. And what I'm trying to show you here, and I'll show you the full video of this later, is identifying the bleeding source and controlling it is what can address that rebleeding. 
We have lots of data. This is a meta-analysis from China where 25 studies were pulled, over 5,000 patients were analyzed, and we know that expansion occurs in almost a quarter of these patients. So it's a large patient population. And then thirdly, we have to prevent secondary inflammation because we know that this cascade of events happens at the beginning of the hemorrhage, but if we don't intervene on that and we leave the hematoma, then between four hours and seven days later, this secondary cascade of inflammation that is mediated by the endothelial activation and the microglial activation results in this basogenic edema, this black halo around the hematoma that starts to expand. And then those patients develop severe intracranial hypertension. We know the timeline of this. We know what are the factors that are associated with it. And we know that there's a very early window where these cellular events could be ameliorated, but it needs to be done in a timely fashion. We know that perihematomal edema uh, can worsen patients' outcomes. And conversely, we know that if we remove blood clots that the hematoma decreases and we have that data from this too. Uh, this is a, a YouTube video that I don't know who attributed to, but in my mind, it illustrates what we in neurosurgery feel it's a natural instinct and it is to decompress the brain from these hematomas. It feels right and is one of those natural instincts that unfortunately has not been proven beneficial. We have many medical trials for treatment of intracerebral hemorrhage, and these have been mostly initiated by clinicians, not by surgeons. And all of the things that a clinician can do in the ICU, like blood pressure control, hemostatic medications, uh, hematoma clearance with chelating agents, cytoprotection, um, dysfunction of platelets and its uh, correlation or, or improvement, preconditioning, cerebral edema, even stem cells. All of these things have been done and through millions of dollars of NIH funding in the United States and many other funding sources across the world, we've come up with nothing. None of these trials have been positive. When we looked at the traditional surgical trials, very few trials had been done in the past. Only one of those, this small Austrian study published in 1989 was positive, but the other ones were not. And when we looked at what was published on surgery, on meta-analysis, the results of those analysis showed that there was insufficient evidence to conclude that surgery was a good thing. And uh, the trends that were slightly positive were not sufficient to move the needle. So in terms of conventional surgery, the STITCH trial carried out by Professor Mendelo and colleagues and published in The Lancet in 2005 was a failed trial for surgery. It did not show a superiority to medical management. And their second uh, attempt at that, the um, STITCH2 study that was focused on lobar hemorrhages only, also was a negative study. It didn't result in improved neurological outcomes for these patients. So based on that, the American Heart and American Stroke Association based their guidelines and their recommendations um, in their previous version of 2015 using all of these data. So medical interventions, the things that we do in the ICU, they all have class one data, correcting coagulopathies, controlling blood pressure, et cetera. But surgery was only uh, supported by class one data for cerebral hematomas. Supertentorial hemorrhages, which are 85% of the hemorrhage, were not uh, recommended because of lack of data. And this was the language that we had back in 2015 where essentially it says that we don't know if it works, only do it if your patient is dying. And the effectiveness of any minimally invasive procedures was still uh, questioned. So we have new guidelines that just came out. They came out in the month of July and um, they have the standard format of all the recommendations. They have things about imaging, blood pressure management, correction of coagulopathy, uh, and antiplatelet use, use of hemostatic agents, et cetera, et cetera. But to what is relevant to us is that using the recently acquired data, 
it says that minimally invasive evacuation can be useful to reduce mortality when compared to medical management. It may be a reasonable uh, alternative uh, over conventional craniotomy to improve functional outcomes. And that's based on looking at conventional craniotomy from the stitch trials and that the effectiveness of uh, these techniques is still uncertain and high power randomized trials are necessary, which is what we're doing. So a lot of these data came from uh, the MISTI trial. For If you're not familiar, MISTI was an approach where you place a catheter with stereotactic guidance, you gently aspirate, and then you do an infusion of TPA for several days. This was the blind child of Dan Halley, Mario Succarello, and Isama White. And the study showed that there was a survival benefit. Patients with that intervention lived uh, more than patients that were medically managed. But the uh, primary outcome measures, which was a modified ranking score at six months and then at a year, did not show a significant benefit. There was a trend, but it was not significantly beneficial. What we did learn from this study is that if you reach a treatment goal of leaving less than 15 milliliters of blood behind, the patients have a greater likelihood of achieving a modified ranking score of zero to three, a good outcome. Unfortunately, they only reached that goal in 59% of the patients. So the technique did not perform well in 41% uh, of the patients, but in the ones that it did perform well, it did get them to an improved neurological outcome. So we know what went wrong in these trials. We know what happened in the STITCH trial, for example, where the technique was not properly controlled. We know uh, that there was no uh, reporting of the extent of clot evacuation, and there was a very broad surgical protocol. So there were a lot of mistakes that happened back then. Uh, MISTI trial, again, failed on getting to that good outcome in enough patients. So that what happened there. But more importantly, several of these trials have tried to lump all of these hemorrhages into a single bucket. And in my mind, and I think every clinician sees this, these are not the same disease. A lower hemorrhage is not the same to an anterior basal ganglion hemorrhage, and it's not the same to a thalamic hemorrhage. And we need to understand which ones of these are good surgical candidates and how they're going to progress and what are appropriate expectations of success. When we, most of us uh, did our uh, residency training, that's, the map of eloquent cortex that we learned. But all of these other areas that we used to think were not eloquent turn out to be very eloquent. And we know now that there's a lot of subcortical connectivity that is critically important for outcomes. None of these things were considered when these previous trials were designed. So what we looked at is with all of these failed trials, these are the things that we need to revamp. Number one, patient selection. Number two, timing of the intervention. What's a really uh, proven benefit of intervening early in these patients? And how do we do it? What's the technique, the training, and the technology required? And if you combine all of these things, you should reach this ideal surgical procedure. You have to remove the mass effect immediately maximize the extent of clot evacuation, minimize the injury when you're doing the procedure, see well enough to do good hemostasis, decrease the length to stay of these patients and decrease the overall cost to the system. So that's where these concepts came about. And we use this uh, multi-pronged uh, approach for this. Number one, we use better imaging to understand how to get to these clots without causing a lot of damage using intraoperative navigation, using a minimally disruptive device, using good visualization tools so you can look down these small uh, ports of entry and using resection tools designed for that. And of course, collecting data on the hematoma, on the perihematomal edema and on the microenvironment. So we've been using this system called the Brain Path. It's a, a 13.5 millimeter diameter that has a 0.9 millimeter tip that is blunt. This is designed for transsulcal axis and it's used and placed with an stereotactic device. That allows us to get away from these guys, from the blade retractors and the concept of using this fixed 
single or double axle retractors and the amount of ischemia they caused is very well known. We have animal data, we have clinical data, and we know exactly how these impact the brain. So by using a radial retractor, we're spreading that force around and decreasing the amount of ischemic injury secondary to just pure retraction and access. We learn from people like Professor Yassergill, from Lenny Malis and many others that transulcal access protects the cortical structures and it should be used whenever possible. And this is a device that's been designed for transulcal access. Optics have evolved a lot in neurosurgery and in general in uh, surgical technology. We now have this uh, digital exoscopes that can provide stunning images. And when we're working down a port, this is the system that we have been using. This is a robotic exoscope made by a Canadian company called Synaptive. And that's the one that we use. It tracks this minimal access port as it moves around the field. And it allows us to be in focus and in proper magnification as we're working around. So this cartoon puts it all together. This is a left basal ganglia hematoma access through a transulcal access point. You see the port being deployed with the navigation probe and exoscope that will be looking down. But once we are at target, we revert back to our neurosurgical principles. You have a suction in one hand, a bipolar, a tool to remove the hematoma, and you can do traditional microsurgery. So this is a classic example of this. This is a 74-year-old patient presenting with a right-sided uh, basal ganglia hemorrhage and uh, a pretty significant stroke burden in terms of symptoms. And this is her DTI study where we look at what happened to the fiber tracts. And now we know that the singular fasciculus is displaced medially. The superior longitudinal fasciculus, which is the green fasciculus, is displaced laterally. And we're designing an entry point that is going to go along the long axis of those two to prevent transecting those fibers and causing additional damages. And then we simulate how that port is going to be deployed we plan our incision and craniotomy, and then we go to the operating room, and this is a short video of that. So the patient's nose is gonna be at the top of the screen, and uh, we see um, a very small dural opening. We open the arachnoid sharply along the sulcus, but we don't dissect down to the sulcus, and then we place the port. This is a 75 millimeter port that is about to get to target. And then uh, you'll see this, reaching its target, there's this white device attached to it, our reflective spheres. So we can use uh, navigation guidance for the placement. And once we are at target, we activate our exoscope that aligns with the port. And now we're looking down the port, we turn on our filters and then we're seeing the hematoma starting to erupt. As we start working on it, more clot starts to come out. This is a device that we use to expedite the clot removal. And as I show you in the very beginning, the critical part of this in my mind is this, is identifying what we think is the source of the bleeding and cauterizing that bleeding point to avoid any rebleeding. Then we continue with evacuating all of that hematoma. Once we're happy with the clot evacuation, we inspect, we make sure there's no bleeding. We do our traditional hemostasis, retract the port sequentially, do more inspection and hemostasis, and then pull out our port completely. That procedure, skin to skin, should take less than an hour on anybody's hands. It's a very, very simple thing to do. And you can see the preservation of the cortical structures and the uh, vessels that are located in the cortical surface. So the clot evacuation of these patients is very satisfactory. And uh, we've seen some early data that was very promising. We tried it in many different locations and types of hemorrhages. And we published multi-center and single institution studies that show some promising results. High rates of clot evacuation with improved in soft measures of neurological function. We did some initial in-house studies. This is one of our studies that we published where we saw that the likelihood of a favorable discharge was significantly improved that we did this procedure when compared to medical management. And based on all of this data, we put together the ENRICH trial. 
So this is a multi-center group. We have neurosurgeons, neurocritical care intensivists, neuroradiologists, drug neurologists. We have 32 sites across the United States that are participating in the study. If you'd like to learn more details about it, this is our website, enrichtrial.com. This is the purpose of this study, is to provide clinical evidence of functional improvement. We need to prove that this is, of course, safe. And then there is an economic benefit when we treat these patients in this way versus medical management. This is a multi-center, randomized, adaptive clinical trial, and I'll go into details on what that means, comparing standard medical management to early, less than 24 hours from last known normal, surgical evacuation using this, this system when compared to medical management. This is the first adaptive clinical trial that was designed with enrichment based on the location of the hemorrhage. So we are trying to be very aware that location significantly changes your outcomes. Um, we are block randomizing based on two locations, the anterior base of ganglia or a lower location. And the sample size being an adaptive trial fluctuates between 150 and 300 patients with interim analysis at different time points. Uh, an adaptive design means that we are able to do longitudinal modeling anytime we do an interim analysis. That allows us to predict the 180-day outcome using 90-day modified ranking scores using variables like age, size of the hematoma, their GCS, the location, and the timing of, of the uh, presentation. And of course, if you're not familiar with this, this is based on Bayesian probability. That's an interpretation of the concept of probability where instead of using frequency or propensity of the event, which is what we would do in a traditional randomized trial using the frequentist approach, we are interpreting probability as a reasonable expectation representing a state of knowledge. That means that as the trial evolves, we learn from the data coming in and we can adapt the study to make it more nimble and more effective and safer for the patients. We had early rules for early success or early futility. None of those rules were met. So we continued the study uh, throughout the interim analysis. These are the inclusion and exclusion criteria, 18 to 80 years of age, primary ICHs, GCS of five to 14, volumes of 30 to 80 and patients presenting within 24 hours of last known normal with a good historical modified ranking score. The exclusion criteria are the ones that are common for all of these studies. Of course, no hemorrhage is caused by aneurysms, AVMs, et cetera. Patients with sufficient symptoms, so NIH shows scales greater than five. No one that was uh, progressing to brain death, so no herniation signs. IVH tolerated, but less than 50% of the lateral ventricles. No primary thalamic hemorrhages, because in our pilot studies, we saw thalamic hemorrhages progressing to a good outcome, but they took almost twice as long to get there, most likely because of the dissection of the hemorrhage into the midbrain. Anticoagulants that couldn't be rapidly reversed, that has changed because of the release of Andexa, which allows us to treat patients on 10A inhibitors. Uh, but those are uh, the um, exclusion criteria. So this is our enrollment update. We've enrolled 298 out of our 300 patients. So we are two patients short of completing this trial. And uh, when we look at the results of the different things around, and you look at uh, extent of clot evacuation, my space, which was our prospective trial, was about 90%. Uh, a single center study using this technique was Mark Bain at the Cleveland Clinic with 96% clot evacuation. And then some of the endoscopic uh, clot evacuation rates are getting up there at 88%. So there's a lot of activity in this field. These are the ongoing clinical trials listed on NIH.gov. We have Enrich up there, but we also have the SWITCH study, which is um, the Swiss uh, hemicraniectomy study we have the MIND study, uh, the INVEST and the DIST, which are all endoscopic trials. And we have some new trials with uh, a new device that uh, the folks from Integra are working on. So there's a lot of excitement in this field, a lot of trials going on. Hopefully it will be the first trial to be done in the modern era. And we should be able to provide some more conclusive evidence as to whether this is the right thing to do. But for now, I think that it's a promising uh, option. So 
with that, I'll take uh, any questions, uh, Professor Du. Thank you again to the Congress for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Perdilla. It's very impressive talking. And uh, let me, uh, may I have the first question? And in the study design, you mentioned uh, in the method part, you mentioned you have the uh, uh, DTI tracking to review the connectivity status and to use the Nico brain power system to avoid uh, the uh, tracks. So does that mean that every patient in your in this enriched trial have an emergent MRI before surgery? That is a very good question. The short answer is no. So when we did our pilot studies, we identified what we call the three uh, main trajectories to be used based on DTI data. So for an anterior basal ganglia, that trajectory is the one I mentioned, coming anteriorly from front to back. That's the one that you're seeing there. And that one is very consistent. If you have a hematoma in that location, very consistently, the singular fasciculus is moved laterally and uh, the superior longitudinal fasciculus is displaced uh, laterally, the cingulate medially, and that trajectory is very safe. For a lobar hemorrhage, of course, it depends on where the hemorrhage is located. And if it's a location where it's involving corticospinal tract or arcuate fasciculus, then we do an emergent MRI for planning. If you're not concerned about those tracts, then we can be a lot more liberal. And of course, it depends if it comes to the surface or not. Most of these lower hemorrhages are going to come to the surface. So you are less worried about these. So it's not an absolute requirement. It depends on the location. The reason thalamics are tricky is because your access point for a thalamic hemorrhage is the parietal occipital sulcus. And you're trying to avoid injury in the arcuate fasciculus, the ascending rami of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, the optic radiations, and the displacement of those fibers is very unpredictable. When we did our pilot studies, we would predict a priori, we would say probably arcuate and SLF are displaced superiorly and posteriorly. And it, many times we were wrong on our prediction and the DTI showed otherwise. And we didn't find a consistent way to do that without DTI, which is one of the reasons also why thalamics were not part of the study. I think the patients with thalamics will benefit from this, but it requires a more thoughtful, deliberate approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are two, two, I think there are a few questions uh, at the chat box, uh, Professor Gastevo. Uh, uh, you, may I read out the question? Uh, asking about, have you ever uh, tried a stereotactic uh, uh, aspiration uh, in your technique? Uh, basically? Yes. So the short answer is yes, we've tried it. And that can function well in clots that are very liquefied. But as probably all of us have experienced, these clots can be very tenacious. So putting a catheter and trying to aspirate oftentimes gives you very unsatisfactory results. You can get a little bit of clot out, but a lot of it is already congealed clot and it requires much more aggressive evacuation than that. That's why the MISPI approach was aspiration plus the thrombolytic because the aspiration alone was not sufficient. Yeah, there are another two questions from Professor Harshad. Uh, asking, yeah. do you have any set of size of the clot for you to intervene? And how many uh, of your patients have neurological recovery? Yeah, I'm, I love that, um, that question. And I'm going to reshare this just to show you something that I think will be the answer. So I don't think that there's going to be a single technique that will apply to all hemorrhages. I think it's going to vary and it varies by location. For example, an anterior base ganglia hemorrhage, it becomes symptomatic with smaller volume. So a volume of 20 cc's already causes significant dysfunction in the basal ganglia. But a 20 cc lower hemorrhage, it barely causes any disturbance unless it's, it's located on uh, corticospinal fibers or arcuate fasciculus fibers. So you can tolerate a lot less volume and you should intervene with something that's less invasive there. 
Conversely, if you go high on volume in the basal ganglia, let's say you're going after a clot that's 80 cc's or 100 cc's, there has been so much damage there that your ability to significantly change this patient outcome is significantly decreased. You will get them to live longer. We know that. They will survive, but your chance of reverting any neurological injury, it's much lower. So for basal ganglia, I think 20 to 50 cc's is a really good range. For lower hemorrhages, I think your range should be higher on the lower threshold. So it should start at 30 and then it can go higher. We've all seen patients with big hemorrhages, 100 cc hemorrhages, but they're right frontal lobe and they're older patients, they have brain atrophy, they tolerate that and they can actually do well. And I have several patients that I've treated on the very high end of that spectrum that do really well. So in the lower side, maybe 30 to 100 is a good range. And then in terms of thalamic hemorrhage, I think the same applies as the anterior basal ganglia, somewhere around 30 to 50. So once these trials come out, I think we'll be able to see that the volume and the location will be very critical to determine which one. And then the last part of that equation is gonna be timing. If you can intervene quickly, then you don't have to deal with the big perihematomal edema and you can be minimally invasive. If unfortunately you get a patient that has been in another hospital, transferred to your hospital, and they've been with a hematoma for five days, yes, removing the hematoma will help, but most likely they'll need a decompressive craniectomy because the amount of swelling is already so much that taking the volume of the clot out is not going to be enough for the treatment. Thank you, thank you, Professor. I myself have two questions for you, Professor. Uh, I, I do perform a hematoma evacuation in hypertensive bleed. Uh, there are some occasions that the, the clot are very well organized. It's very difficult to remove the clot just by suction. Sometimes you put a high suction, the risk of damaging the underlying brain is very high. Have you ever tried a CUSA, uh, treat it as a tumor in your case uh, for safe removal? My first question. My second pro question, Professor, uh, regarding the DTI again, uh, do you observe a patient that with a good uh, DTI, especially cortical spinal tract, we have a better neurological uh, improvement than those uh, we are? Thank you, Professor. Thank you. So to your first question, I have not used a CUSA because I have the device that was in that video is called the Myriad device. And it's, you can think of it as a micro debrider that the ENT surgeon would use. It's a suction cutting device and that works really well for thick clots. So that's why I don't have to use a CUSA. When I don't have that, then it's more difficult. There are other devices, for example, Penumbra, makes a device for endoscopic evacuation and Integra has another device like this. So there are different devices because we all, as you have, struggle when you have thick fibrous clots. To your uh, second question, yes. So we have a small uh, cohort of patients that we've done tactography pre and post. Uh, the field of quantifiable tractography is still very early in its development. So how do you quantify tract recovery? So you use different analysis based on pixels in the image to try to say, this is the volume of the corticospinal tract before and after. But what we do have is several of these patients where the injury was to corticospinal and they had motor recovery. And we have correlation of corticospinal being compressed and the corticospinal being thicker after the evacuation. We have less of those with speech deficits, and we have a few of those with optic radiations. So I think one of the things that we, we have to understand and appreciate is that these hematomas rarely cause severe tract disruption. Many times they're causing compression but they dissect the fibers away. They don't destroy them. So you have an opportunity to be careful and preserve a lot of function if you're gentle with the technique that you're using. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Sabaresh, do you have any question for our speaker, Professor Gaspar? Uh, uh, great talk, Gustavo. Um, 
Um, the question I had was, you know, uh, from my understanding, and I, I'm a big proponent of doing this technique of using the knee comirid uh, and evacuating uh, the intracerebral hemorrhages. If this gets proven, what is going to be the workload for neurosurgeons? You know, what do you think is going to happen? You know, we're going to have all these hemorrhages that need to be evacuated. How do you think that is going to be handled? Is this going to be something that a cerebrovascular neurosurgeon is going to do with the thrombectomy, or how is this going to be handled? So that those are that's a phenomenal set of questions, and some that I philosophically ask myself. I said, if this is successful, I'm going to ruin my life because I'm going to have to come in and do these clots in the middle of the night, and I don't do endovascular thrombectomy for that reason because I didn't want to have that lifestyle. But um, I think within 24 hours of evacuation seems to be first and foremost safe. So you're not causing more re-bleeding. If we prove that under eight hours is beneficial, then we're gonna have to start getting up in the middle of the night. Uh, we'll see, I don't know if we'll have enough power to do a subgroup analysis of timing. What happens eight hours, eight to 12 hours, 12 to 24. It's part of our subgroup analysis and we're gonna do it, but we don't have enough power to parcel out hour to hour benefits. But I do think that earlier is better. To your second question, we wanted to do a procedure that anybody could do. So if we have a hemorrhage that is in a safe location, so the anterior basic ganglia where you don't have to get tractography because you know the trajectory, this, the procedure is so safe that if you have a CT angiogram that is negative and you feel comfortable that there's no risk of this being an AVM or anything else, that anybody can do this. You don't have to be Gassi Yasergil to do the procedure. Anybody can suction that clot out, use the bipolar for hemostasis and get out quickly. And because timing is an issue, if you're in an isolated part of the country or the world where the closest comprehensive stroke center with a, a fellowship trained cerebrovascular surgeon is four, six, eight hours away and you have a patient that's critically ill, you should be able to do this safely. So I think if this were to be uh, proven beneficial, it would be accessible to everyone. Now, liability questions will come into place as to whether people would feel comfortable doing this and in the discussion of whether this is a procedure that should be within the realm of a comprehensive stroke center and limited to certain types of people. That's a discussion that's above my pay grade, but I think the procedure is pretty simple. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Professor, for bringing uh, uh, this uh, technology and uh, uh, findings and knowledge about the evolve, evolving uh, uh, technique in, in, in uh, the one can be considered one of the most neglected uh, or less evolved neurosurgical field, uh, hypertensive uh, hemorrhage, and uh, same with uh, in, uh, traumatic brain injury. And I think uh, there's a long way to go and hopefully a new result will be presented by Professor in our following uh, update uh, webinar. Uh, uh, may I call upon Professor Du for the concluding remark, Professor? Okay, so uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Bradilla. And uh, let's uh, go into the next session. Hi, uh, just a minute. I'm going to um, do a little introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. So um, we're going to talk about hybrid neurovascular as a specialty. Um, I just thought I would just uh, uh, give a couple of thoughts, and I'm sure uh, Professor Lau will ad address some of this in his talk. Um, you know, when I think about hybrid uh, neurosurgery, you know, it's being a microsurgeon, cerebrovascular, skull-based surgeon, endovascular neurosurgeon, partly being an intensivist, a stroke neurosurgeon, understanding vascular neurology, doing cerebrovascular research, running a microsurgery lab, and training residents and fellows, which is a lot of hats that I think we wear as a neurovascular specialist. Um, and we all know the neurointervention field is changing too, because there's an increasing number of centers which are becoming thrombectomy capable because of access issue, because of the time window. 
What that does is there are more and more personal waiting on call and the number of cases are becoming lesser and lesser. And slowly they start doing aneurysms, AVMs and stuff like that, even though really it's a thrombectomy center, but then you start taking care of aneurysms, AVMs with low volumes and dilution of experience. Uh, we also know that there's a lot of subdural hematoma embolization trials that are going on. And uh, the expectation is that some of these are going to get positive and the number of embolization for subdural hematoma is going to be more than stroke thrombectomy. So um, if you see the number of neuro interventions we are doing today versus what we were doing five to 10 years ago, we are almost double or triple just because thrombectomy has become standard of care. And now we're going to add subdural hematomas, which is going to be the same volume or more than thrombectomies. And then we're going to add intravascular chemotherapy for brain tumors, uh, stent roads for brain computer interface, endovascular shunts for hydrocephalus, and as Dr. Pradilla said, MAS ICH evacuation. So we are broadening the scope of what is what a hybrid specialist is going to do. And the number of cases and the volume and the expertise is going to be more varied and broader. Uh, so who is taking care of these neurovascular patients today? We have neurointerventional radiologists, we have interventional neurologists, we have endovascular neurosurgeons who are all trained to do this. And then we have other subspecialists like interventional cardiologists, vascular surgeons, um, and uh, interventional radiologists who are body IR trained, radiation oncologists who take care of radiation for AVMs, and then open neurovascular surgeons, which I call is like a, a dying dinosaur breed, right? Which uh, is slowly becoming extinct because everyone is becoming dual trained today. Um, and um, so how do we train and practice in the future with all this evolution? Do you have to stay in the lane and say a vascular surgeon needs to treat only vascular pathology? But if you're going to treat subdural hematomas, tumor, epilepsy, functional, hydrocephalus, then is this being a neuroendovascular specialist or you're just a cranial neurosurgeon? Uh, and how do we, do we need to broaden this lane to call it a cranial speciality where someone is doing microsurgery, endovascular and radiation therapy for all these patients? Or do we need to narrow it down into endovascular neurosurgery? And if we're going to treat subdural hematomas, stroke, epilepsy, everything through endovascular catheter-based training, then this should this be part of basic neurosurgical training, like what Dr. Pradilla said, should every neurosurgeon be able to do some basic endovascular procedures like angiography, thrombectomy, subdural hematoma evacuation, and then advanced fellowship for other interventions. Um, the next aspect is with increasing number of people doing endovascular training and neurosurgery, there are a lot of people who don't do advanced fellowship training in microsurgery and call themselves a dual trained neurosurgeon. What that does is they get more and more comfortable doing endovascular as they go through their careers that they do not, they are really not dual trained specialists and they kind of err on the side of doing more endovascular than open surgery. So how do we keep this skill set? is in my opinion, I do this by doing skull-based tumors and uh, complex uh, cranial tumors because that keeps my microsurgical skill set up. And when I need it for my uh, vascular surgery, I can use it. Otherwise, I think my percentage of doing microsurgery will be very, very low. Um, so with, with that, I'm going to introduce Professor Lau. Uh, he is the medical director of cerebrovascular surgery at uh, Houston Sugar Length Testis, Texas. Uh, he's been in the position for almost a year. Before that, he was the director of neurosurgery at Lakeland Regional Medical Center, um, uh, which is attached to University of South Florida, Tampa General Hospital. Uh, he's been in that position for more than seven years. In that position, he did an endovascular training after his uh, residency training in Tampa. Uh, he uh, crossed path with me uh, because he's a medical school from SUNY Buffalo, where I trained too. Um, and uh, he is uh, well respected in the community. He has many publications, uh, book chapters, and podium presentations. I welcome Professor Law to give his talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadarajan. Thank you very, very much for your kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Can you guys see this? Yes. Okay, perfect. 
Can you make it full screen, Paul? Yes, yes. Good. All right. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Subin for his very kind invitation and uh, for giving me this opportunity to present on this topic. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here. So I'll be talking about cerebrovascular surgery today. I have no disclosure. So there are many great hybrid surgeons out there. Uh, I'm not going to argue against that. There are many great hybrid surgeons, but if you look into the literature, there seems to be an underutilization of the hybrid operating room. And I'm going to give you a few examples. If you look, if you look at this series of how they use the hybrid operating room, it's basically to perform intraoperative angiography. This is another series of more than 1,800 cases done in the hybrid OR uh, in four years gap. And you can see only eight of those were actually truly hybrid procedures. This is another series of more than 1,000 cases. And you can see there's only 19 of those were actually truly hybrid procedures. So I've, I do think that there's a, an underutilization of the hybrid facility uh, in general. So when we look at cerebrovascular diseases, you can essentially divide it into either open or endovascular. I would say most people would claim or agree that patients with different various vascular pathology, most of them actually would benefit from endovascular therapy, and some of which may benefit from open. And then you have this group in between that is what I consider overlap. It could be done either or, and patient can still be benefit depending on the experience of the, of the surgeons who, uh, who was treating the, the patient. And then if you take it a step further, then you can see that there is perhaps a third group, a third subspecialty in the cerebrovascular world, where this group of patients, although there is maybe overlap with open or endovascular, there's a distinct subset of population that perhaps may benefit solely for hybrid treatment. Okay, so I'm going to give some examples as how I use the hybrid techniques in my practice. And first of which would be uh, carotid artery stenosis. So carotid stenosis is kind of a really strange uh, type of uh, vascular condition compared to everything else we do. If you look at all the vascular, different vascular conditions uh, in the body, I would say endovascular have pretty much took over, right, has become the... Um, the main modality, treatment modality for, for, for these patients. But in terms of carotid artery diseases, carotid and erectomy, open procedures is still the, the main go-to option. And this is due to you know, numerous trial results, crash study, short-term, long-term outcome. And today I'm not gonna go into the, the, you know, the indication for carotid artery surgery, but this is just show you that, what, uh, that CEA, open surgery, is still the, the main modality, and, and I'm going to go through uh, the reason as to why, right? So the reason is that the outcome for treating with endovascular technique, uh, the, at least the risk of stroke in general, uh, if you look at the literature across the years, that the risk of stroke is a little bit higher with carotid artery stenting. Uh, but that being said, the outcome is slowly getting better due to the improvement of technology. And one of which would be the development of the distal protection devices. You can see uh, some of these examples on the top left corner. But there are limitations to the distal protection devices. These devices allows you to capture any potential emboli while you're doing the procedure of stenting or angioplasty. But if you look at the picture uh, on the top right corner, these are all the relative contraindication for using a distal protection device, where either crossing would be impossible or uh, by crossing the lesion with the distal protection device can cause a stroke. These are the reason why the following device were uh, developed, the GORE device and the MOMA de device you can see uh, on, on the bottom. And the goal of these two devices is to reverse the flow so that when you cross the lesion, that uh, any potential debris is gonna reverse back to uh, being captured by filter. And, and so on paper, you know, these two devices, uh, I think it's, it's good, but these two devices still don't overcome the limitation of the aortic arch, right? Whether it is navigating through the tough anatomy of the aortic arch or dealing with aortic arch disease where you can have potential plaques coming off from the aorta and that could cause stroke, right? So 
this is um, exactly why, these are the reason why the T card technique was being invented. The T card technique, um, you can see here uh, on the bottom right, require a tiny little incision compared to the incision that would require for carotid endorectomy. The incision is made right above the clavicle and, and then you access the common carotid artery with a sheath and then connect it to the uh, uh, femoral vein. And so after you clamp the vessel proximally, the blood flow, the direction of, of the blood flow is being reversed and any potential debris will be captured by this uh, filter device uh, you can see in the middle. So this is what I consider a hybrid approach. And the advantage of using the T-car approach is that it is essentially minimally invasive, right? Compared to uh, carotid anorectomy, it avoids all the bad stuff associated with aortic arch. Uh, it avoids um, extensive dissection of the cranial nerve plexus to avoid uh, cranial nerve injury. And it allows the reversal flow to protect the brain from emboli and also the, because of the working distance of the T-car approach, the, all the catheters and wires are much shorter to, the, to your target. Uh, it makes stenting and uh, angioplasty very accurate because the short uh, working distance. So in terms of the outcome for the uh, T-car technique, you can see through uh, two trials, the Roaster 1 and the Roaster 2 trials. And the Roaster 2 is a much larger trial and they, Enrolled, you can see here the enrolled high surgical risk patient. Right, these are the patients that would be considered having higher risk of stroke or uh, heart attack and, and and so forth based on their medical comorbidities. And yet, you can see the outcome is actually pretty good uh, if you compare to the outcome of the Crest study. The T uh, Roster one and Roster two trial, the outcome of stroke, the risk of stroke is less than one point four percent. Right. So this is these are pretty good number. Again, these are high surgical risk patient compared to the Crest study. These are the standard surgical risk patient. Right. So, and this is also true when it comes to heart attack because of a much shorter procedure, much shorter incisions that you're going to make, and also lesser risk of cranial nerve injury compared to carotid interactive. As you can imagine, this is a very powerful technique, and it again. A, grows uh, a, a popularity, a lot of popularity after it's been uh, put out in the market. And you can see the increased use of the T car in the United States and Canada and, um, and compared to transfermal artery uh, carotid stenting. So I'm gonna go for examples, uh, a few examples as how I use T car in my practice uh, to treat cerebrovascular diseases. This is a patient who had history of carotid anorectomy many years ago. Uh, presented with uh, TIAs. And so this patient, I think it would be a perfect candidate for T-car technique because it avoids all the scars from pivot surgery. And also the uh, scar, the incision you're gonna make is gonna be below the pivot surgery, right? So that uh, make, makes the access very easy. And you can also look at the, looking at the angiogram, the diagnostic angiogram, that if you try to cross this lesion with any wire, or any uh, balloon or digital protection device, it has a high risk of embolization. So T-car is, is ideal to treat this group of patient population. And you can see the post-denting picture, it looks pretty good. And what's also interesting is that if you look at the filter that was uh, cut out after the procedure is being done, you can see the plaque that was being captured uh, by the filter device. So if we didn't use T-car for this uh, patient, then patient can easily have gotten a stroke. So that was the T car. Uh, it's been FDA approved to be useful, and I also used this to treat intracranial stenosis. So this is an example of a patient who presented with recurrent symptoms of speech problems, and he patient failed medical management. And you can see there's a tandem stenosis in the Petrus ICA and the Carpenter's ICA. This is these are also the locations that pistol protection device cannot be safely used, right? So this is a great example of how we can use T-car to treat the patient. And you can see the post-angioplasty picture. And again, uh, the plaque, some of the plaques that has been captured by the digital protection device. So I think this also provide a good solution for intracranial pathology. And this is a case series that we published recently. Uh, we only had a few cases back then when we published this technique. Uh, but now the case series is a bit bigger um, in terms of using this technique to treat 
um, distal ICA stenosis. Uh, we did not have any complications related to surgery with one death that was not related to the treatment of TPAR. And right now we're working on a randomized control trial to test uh, the effectiveness of this technique compared to a standard angioplasty and stenting. So the cases that I showed earlier, um, you can still argue, oh, maybe I can still do those cases uh, based on transfemoral or transradial, given the you know, expertise of the physician. I think you can argue that. Uh, I, I, think, I, think, uh, I, I, I think that's reasonable. Uh, if the treating surgeon has a lot of experience with transfemoral uh, or transradial. Uh, but the following case I'm gonna show is a case that I don't think we could have treated this patient without the, the TCAR technique. This is a very interesting case. This is a patient that was treated previously with uh, pseudo, uh, pseudo aneurysms in the neck. He was uh, sent to me for further evaluation of, or, and, and treatment after uh, the follow-up study. And you can see this is a, a patient where he had a stent for a pseudo aneurysm uh, in the this, uh, distal cervical ICA. And the stent, I would say, perhaps maybe a little bit too short, um, I think ideally would be um, if you extend more distal, uh, proximal, uh, longer, or maybe even tack it down with a standard carotid stand uh, with much larger radial force uh, would be uh, uh, better. Uh, but this patient unfortunately had a stand that was placed short. And over time uh, on follow up, you find this had the stand retracted into the pseudo aneurysm sac. And you can see where the stand is positioned. If you um, do endovascular, you can imagine the crossing this stand with a wire gaining access, it would be very difficult to impossible, right? Because of the angle. This is a patient also fine to have thrombus within the pseudo aneurysm sac. So any manipulation from below, from uh, a classic uh, you know, approach uh, endovascularly would also, can also cause uh, stroke. Uh, and it would be bad news, right? If any of those thrombus uh, cause uh, embolization to the, uh, let's say the MCA uh, vessel, because you won't be able to have access to go through the ICA safely to get that clot off. So this is a, a very tough situation. This is a patient that you can you know, consider anticoagulation and leave it alone. Uh, I don't think that was a good idea because of the age of the patient. Open surgery is probably not gonna be a good idea because you don't have the distal control. Uh, because of the pseudo aneurysm sac extended all the way to the skull base. And in terms of endovascular uh, approach, uh, again, you know, it's difficult to gain access and also uh, you can potentially cause thrombus and emboli. So I think this case would be great to use TCAR to protect the patient in order to gain access endovascularly. And this is what we did. You can see the sheath on uh, uh, the TCAR sheath that was placed uh, on the picture on the left. After the, the T car sheath was being paced, uh, placed, after it cut down to the uh, carotid artery, a direct cut down, then I also approached the rotibral artery from, the, uh, from a different axis yeah, that you can see uh, the picture uh, on the, uh, in the middle where the catheter is gained full access for the rotibral, ar uh, rotibral artery, go through the posterior communicating artery, and then back into the uh, ICA to get the, define the true lumen, right? This is the best way to find a true movement through retrograde access. So once that's done, you can see the wire that is being uh, put into the aneurysm sac uh, from above uh, through, the, uh, through the stem. And then once that's done, uh, the rest will be easy. Put the key car sheath. You know, what I had to do is to use a stand uh, uh, device to capture that wire from below because now the flow is reversed. I don't have to worry about any potential embolization. So, so once, once that, that the two wire um, uh, uh, is being uh, attached together, all I have to do is to, to gently tuck on it uh, from below to straighten the stand. And then I will advance a sheath uh, to uh, go through the, uh, to gain the true access of the catheter. And then the rest will be easy, just like any standing case. And in this case, we use a cover stand and you can see the immediate, immediate um, uh, post-op uh, angiogram which shows the uh, vessel is nicely reconstructed uh, in trauma So uh, this patient did great, went home. And uh, so as you can see, there's really a role to use the hybrid approach to combine um, the uh, advantages of, of uh, open and endovascular to solve complex problems. 
So I've shown you a few question, uh, cases of using the T-car to, to perform anterograde stenting, but I do think that this is also good for retrograde stenting. And this is a interesting case of common carotid artery stenosis on a patient who presented with TIAs and history of radiation to the neck. And you can see how torturous his aortic arch is. So gaining access from below would be very difficult, whether it's transradial or transfemoral. Uh, and uh, in order to cross the lesion, you also have to uh, cause this stenotic segment. And I think it would be also uh, high, has a pretty reasonable high risk uh, to cause a stroke if you try to approach from below. So this is a patient that I uh, decided to use a T-car uh, to avoid um, this, uh, navigating this anatomy, uh, whether it's trans radial transfemoral. And uh, so the T car, and you can see the T car stand that is uh, being accessed now distally from the distal common carotid artery back. Uh, and then you can easily uh, find the, uh, where the lesion is. And also because the working distance is so short that it allow, allows you to perform stenting and angioplasty with, in a very precise manner. And you can see the post stenting uh, uh, images. Another way you can use the T-car retrograde stenting uh, is to treat a common carotid artery dissection. This is a patient with aortic dissection that extended into right common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery. The left subclavian artery that uh, stenosis uh, was not symptomatic. The patient was symptomatic from the right common carotid artery stenosis from the dissection. And you can see the dissection caused a very thin, uh, tight stenosis at the origin of the enamel artery that extended into the uh, common carotid artery. And you can see there's free density on the CAT scan. The other two would be, one is the false lumen, and the, other, uh, and the third one would be the, the thrombus within the uh, um, uh, dissection. And you can see the tortured anatomy. And if you're gonna gain access from below, it will be difficult to define where that dissection uh, true uh, lumen uh, of the vessel is. So this patient, um, had uh, under one T-car, and you can see again on the angiogram where that's the severe stenosis uh, below, and uh, the false lumen you can see on the angiogram too. So in order to avoid the false lumen and find the true lumen, it would be very easy to gain access through the T-car in a retrograde approach, because once you access, you're already in the true lumen. And you, once all you have to do is to go back proximal and to perform the stenting angioplasty. So this patient, you can see on the picture on the right, patient a, an uneventful uh, stenting uh, with uh, restoring uh, of the diameter of the, uh, of the vessel. So T-car retrograde stenting uh, also helps prevent embolization. It's easy to gain access uh, because uh, if the origin uh, of the stenosis is very tight or when there's a dissection where it makes trouble, uh, give you trouble, may give you trouble to find a true lumen. So I think this is a very powerful technique uh, to treat this type of conditions. So that, that was for T-car. And then I'm going to go for a few other examples, how I use my hybrid uh, operating room to treat uh, some of these vascular conditions. So if you look at the embolization for AVM, unfortunately for Onyx, it has a low cure rate, right? Uh, somewhere between 13 to 24%. And it also has a high complication rate of 5 uh, to uh, 7% of stroke bleeding, things like that. And, uh, and I think the more you push to try to get a radiographic cure with Onyx, the higher risk of complication that you're gonna get. So for patients that who is gonna go for resection, right? Not all the patient that um, is gonna need embolization, but for patients that needs um, resection. And if you try to embolize to uh, cut down the blood supply, to cut down, the, uh, eliminate some of the feeders before surgery, uh, I think that uh, if we can avoid onyx, uh, would be better, right? So since we are not trying to get a greater graphic cure, so this is what I do with ABMs. This is how I approach ABM. This is a simple temporal ABM, plasma marking grade one. Uh, we're feeding vessels from the middle cerebral artery right, with nidal aneurysms. So this is a patient that I would embolize in the hybrid OR in the same day using coils because onyx can take a long time when you try to embolize. So in the hybrid OR, what we can do is to basically drop a few coils that um, uh, you know, takes essentially minutes to stop the bleeders. And you can see the picture on the right uh, after some of the coils is being uh, 
place, the AVM is uh, completely uh, slowed down, and then you can reset it. The advantage of resetting AVM um, with this uh, technique is that um, you don't have to worry about the uh, trouble mobilizing the AVM. You can see the NATO aneurysms, the AVM is grossly shut down. And without the onyx, right, this is just coil. And you can see you can mobilize the nidus very easily. And you don't have to uh, fight with the onyx um, to, uh, to get around the, the AVM. So, so I think this is a, a reasonable approach. If you can take an AVM out anyway, I think doing this in the hybrid OR would be reasonable. And you can see coiling plus surgery in a case like this was two hour, 15 minutes. So uh, this is highly effective and you don't have to worry about patient about hemorrhage and bleeding overnight while waiting for resection if you're gonna use onyx. So the AVM, uh, small AVM, as I showed you on the last case, you can argue that even without embolization, you're gonna be fine. But how about a large AVM like this in the posterior fossa uh, who is, uh, that is causing papillary edema uh, in the young patient? And so this AVM has uh, multiple feeders um, well, some of which are coming from the front uh, of the approach, right? So, so it is import, important to be able to shut down those feeders. And you can see on the picture on the right, uh, so a few coils have been placed at, uh, among uh, various feeders to shut down the AVM. This didn't take long at all. Forward time was only 30 minutes. And um, this also allows you to avoid the onyx so that you can mobilize the AVM, a very large posterior false AVM, you don't want to struggle to be able to mobilize, to be able to find the remaining feeders uh, in the front uh, until the end of the case, right? So this is why uh, coiling uh, in this uh, patient would be uh, very reasonable as well. So this patient had a, an event for uh, resection. Um, the both surgery and embolization only took five hours, 40, 40 minutes. So I think this is a very effective way of treating patients as well. And I do think that this approach is very useful for it. In, in particular for posterior fossa AVM. This is just another example showing you a small AVM that is being bled. This is a superior vermin AVM with feeders coming from the superior cerebellar artery on both sides by loudly. And again, if you imagine the feeders are coming from the front, if you can approach this AVM from the back, whether it is infratentorial or uh, um, transtentorial, you are still going to be able to uh, not able to encounter those feeders until the very end, right? So it is important to embolize this uh, AVM um, and um, without onyx so that you can mobilize it and reset the safety. So this patient again uh, underwent the embolization and surgery in the same, same setting. So this is how I use my hybrid OR to treat AVM. I think we can do everything in the same day. It is efficient. Um, because you don't have to uh, worry about the reflux using onyx, um, and you don't have to worry about uh, the penetration of the onyx, and um, it's easy to um, perform less radiation, and you don't have to worry about the detachment of the catheter uh, after onyx is being used too, right? So I think this is a great uh, uh, technique for some of the AVMs. I'm not arguing that all AVMs should be treated this way, but I think some AVMs, this has to be uh, a, a role treating it like uh, with this. Um, uh, technique. The next one would be anterior uh, dura aerie fistula. For posterior dura aerie fistula, I would say a simple uh, embolization um, using um, among various techniques would make sense. But when you have a fistula that goes direct into the superior sacral sinus, um, I think it would be uh, hard to argue to use uh, onyx, right? Uh, you cannot uh, embolize your anterior, uh, or you cannot embolize or sacrifice your superior sacral sinus. So this is a patient that you know we want to resect it, but what I do is that in the hybrid OR, um, or what I do is to try to catheterize the, the main feeder and just place a few coils or, or onyx, however you want to do it, uh, so that you can tap, you can know exactly um, know, know where the feeder is because it would be difficult to localize using uh, a navigation system such as stealth or brain lab uh, in this um, uh, condition. So I, I like to use coil again to avoid onyx because uh, I don't have to worry about it penetrating too distally or having any reflux. I just have to drop a few coils and then I localize it in the hybrid OR to know where it is and then and then you reset it. Right? So, so I think uh, for anterior dual every fistula, they also uh, has, a, has a role uh, to uh, use uh, this combined technique uh, to uh, treat some of these conditions. How about bypass? 
uh, sh should we consider a hybrid technique uh, to treat a uh, bypass condition, a uh, patient that uh, needed bypass, right? So I'm going to give you a few examples as how I combine, use a combined technique of uh, open and, uh, and vascular surgery to treat some of these uh, complex uh, conditions. So this is a case series from the, by the Mayo, Mayo Clinic, and they talk about embolizing such, some of the external carotid artery branches to enhance the flow to the STA so that when you perform STMC bypass, uh, there is more flow to the STA to uh, maintain the patency of the bypass to help the patient. So uh, this is an interesting case I, I treated. Uh, this is a patient who had a long segment ICA stenosis, uh, patient failed medical management. And I, I didn't think that it was reasonable to do a long segment angioplasty and stenting at, um, you know, at, at that long of a, a vessel uh, span. So I was thinking more along the line of bypass, but you can, uh, you can see that the problem with the bypass, if you can use STMCA, the STA is very small. The meningeal artery is robust, but without any collateral. The STA is very small. And you can see the, on the picture on the top um, uh, right upper corner that the M, in the common carotid injection that you can see these uh, severe stenosis along the ICA, but then the MCA cortical vessel still feels more rapidly than the uh, STA. So this is a patient, if you do an STA-MCA bypass, just like the way it is now, I don't think it's gonna work because of the competition flow. So this is a patient that I went, uh, uh, took for embolization to the occipital artery and internal maxillary artery. And the size of the STA increased from 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 millimeter. And on the common carotid injection, you can see now that it, the STA feels a lot more rapid than the MCA, right? So, so this is a patient that if you can do a bypass now using STA, I think it would be a higher success rate. This patient underwent a, an eventful bypass and, and went home and you can see the improvement on the CT perfusion. So this is the six months follow up. You can see the uh, robust feeling of the um, uh, um, uh, STA. So that was a, a patient that I performed embolization before bypass. And the next patient I'm gonna show you is embolization after the bypass. Okay. This is a, a very interesting case, a patient who developed an ACA stroke. And a uh, patient was found to have a moi moi disease that affects primarily the ACA territory. On the right side, the ACA territory is infused by pier collateral uh, from the uh, posterior circulation. And on the left side, that where a patient had a stroke, the ACA actually infused by middle meningeal artery, pier collateral. And you can see here on the angiogram. So you do have a middle meningeal artery that you don't want to disrupt, right? So this is a patient, if you're gonna do uh, surgery, you have to watch out for those uh, uh, collateral. And again, not to our surprise, the pre-op CT perfusion, bilateral ACA hypoperfusion. So this patient uh, was allowed to have, uh, because the stroke was uh, pretty devastating, patient was allowed to recover for about four weeks. Uh, patient had a pretty good improvement and then we uh, planned for surgery. And you can see that uh, the craniotomy that we uh, planned uh, was anterior to the middle meningeal collateral, but above the, the frontal sinus. This patient uh, underwent a left STA ACA uh, bypass, and you can see the uh, radio artery graft um, on the intraoperative ICG. And uh, patient had a an eventful bypass. And then, to our surprise, on the post-op day one, we see a worsening of the CT perfusion. Right, so. So why is that? Why is the patient have a worsening of CT perfusion? Patient was taken to the angiogram uh, on post of day one, and you can see that the bypass is patent, right? The bypass is working. But to our surprise, that patient had developed advancement of the disease uh, in the ICA terminus. And you can see where that uh, ICA is severely stenotic. And this contribute to the hyperperfusion to the MCA territory. So now I, I have, um, pretty bad uh, condition that I'm, I'm facing, right? Uh, this is not vasospasms, by the way. This patient was treated as it was vasospasms with different techniques and injections of rapamol. It did not improve. So this, I think this is a progression of the disease. So this is a patient that had um, a worsening of CT perfusion and had a bypass uh, that, you know, you don't want to disrupt this bypass uh, if you can go back in. And you also don't want to destroy the middle meningeal collateral, right? So this is a patient that I didn't want to take back to surgery. Uh, I didn't want to 
disrupt this collateral. So what I did was I embolized the lingual artery and the distal internal maxillary artery. And the patient had a post-embolization CT perfusion, which showed improvement um, after the embolization. And you can see the improvement continues. This could very well be the matur uh, maturation of the uh, uh, ACA bypass. But I do believe that uh, this is also partly, par partly related to the embolization of the, uh, some of the other external branches. So you can see, you can just do, uh, perform this combined approach for rare cases to augment both the STA, whether you can do a pre-op or post-op. And this uh, shows you the benefit of uh, hybrid uh, approaches. Uh, to some of these conditions. This is another uh, interesting case where I treated this with a hybrid technique. This is a patient with uh, just presented with headache, was fine to have a very, uh, uh, with, uh, you know, pretty big uh, MCA aneurysms and a incidental uh, ACOM aneurysms. The MCA aneurysms were the bigger ones, so I, I wanted to treat that first. And what makes this AC, uh, MC, what makes this middle cerebral artery aneurysm difficult is that you can see the calcification at the neck of the aneurysm, right? This make, the, makes the clipping difficult, right? Uh, I know there are many great, you know, open surgeons out there that would, uh, can treat this patient, uh, patient at ease to the full open clip uh, reconstruction. But I just felt that uh, the risk would be a little bit higher to the patient if we're just gonna treat this with open technique because of the calcification. And if you can treat this with just pure endovascular uh, with a flow diverting or a stand core embolization, it would be also difficult because of where the two M2s are located. You cannot use a single flow diverter because the other branch is gonna either keep the aneurysm open or you're gonna get a stroke. So I do think that uh, there's a need to approach this aneurysm with hybrid uh, a combined approach. And I try to turn this uh, a complex uh, condition into two simple procedures. One would be a, a superficial temporary to middle cerebral artery bypass to a smaller branch that I uh, isolated uh, uh, and see distally near the co cortex. And this is the branch that I selected for bypass because it's easier to trap the aneurysm. Once I've done that, uh, once I've done the bypass on the next day, if the patient has no bleeding, I load the patient up with uh, antiplatelet therapy, and then I flow diverting uh, the other branch. Uh, because one branch is already bypassed and trapped, then the other branch with flow diverting would be very easy. And this patient had a combined approach to treat uh, the aneurysm. The aneurysm uh, on, with a flow diverter and bypass and patient did good. And so um, I think for most aneurysms, we can treat it with either open or endovascular. I think that's true. Uh, but for rare cases, such as the one I, I just showed, I think there's a role for combined hybrid uh, approaches. Then the uh, last uh, few cases I'm gonna show uh, will be one would be a direct venous access that I used the hybrid OR. Uh, this is a, um, a rare case where a patient had a occipital palpable mass that was obstruct, obstructing uh, the, the bone but also causing stenosis of the uh, superior sagittal sinus. You may have uh, even eroded uh, the wall. And, and by the way, this is osteosarcoma, right? So this is important to have a good resection and, and margin to have best cure. But if you're gonna resect this, this becomes very difficult uh, or dangerous because the superior sagittal sinus is, is right there. And so what I did was um, I would, uh, I, my plan was to stand uh, put a cover stand in this location to protect the superior sagittal sinus before I reset it. So you can see the, uh, uh, the, the approach where I put the sheet. Because this patient, I'm going to take out the tumor anyway. I'm going to take the patient to OR to uh, perform open surgery. And that a cover stand, uh, th there's no cover stand designed to go in this position, right? A cover stand is very stiff. It's very difficult to navigate uh, the jugular bulb and get all the way to where you need to. So since this patient is going to go for surgery anyway, I directly access the anterior superior sagittal sinus, as you can see by the arrow. And, and, and how I access it is that I use the wire from below. Uh, once I cut open the superior sagittal sinus, I just push this wire out, and then I soft pass the sheath uh, through the wire to get to where I need to. And the stenting would be very straightforward because it's just one straight shot. So this patient had a proper stand to protect the superior sagittal sinus and then underwent resection 
and you can see the patient had a good resection and where the stent is positioned to uh, protect the sinus and also restore the stenosis of the sinus. So again, this is uh, osteosarcoma. So aggressive uh, resection uh, would, would make sense, right? So this patient had a hybrid treatment to this uh, oncological problem. I also use uh, this to access, uh, use the hybrid one to access um, arterial side from time to time. This is a patient who had disabling positive tinnitus from a scap AVM. This is not intracranial, this is scap. So if you can imagine accessing from uh, transfemoral, transradial all the way to where you need to embolize would be very difficult. And so this patient uh, uh, underwent direct arterial access at different branching point um, to get to the distal portion to embolize. And again, this is uh, in the scap, this is uh, not in the brain. So we don't need to completely treat it, right? We just have to treat the patient's uh, symptoms, which was the postal tinnitus, and uh, which uh, uh, pretty much resolved uh, after embolization. So in conclusion, I think we have to think outside of cerebrovascular versus endovascular versus dual train. I, I think that we have to think about uh, a condition as uh, not a cerebrovascular surgeon's AVM, for example, not an endovascular surgeon's AVM. It's not a dual trained surgeon's AVM. It is the patient's AVM. It is our responsibility to define and to find the best solution for our patients and the safest one for our patients, right? And I believe that by working together, such as uh, even not just people dual trained, but also people that, can, uh, that only do open, people that only do endovascular because they can bring a lot of expertise to the table to um, uh, have uh, a lot of insights and, and knows the limits of uh, either all those uh, uh, techniques very well. And only if we can put all these people together, right? Um, the uh, people from uh, various uh, subspecialty and different training background where we can expand the field of hybrid surgery. And in the future, I think with the improvement of technology and experience, I do think that there is would be a um, of high utilization of hybrid technique to treat complex cerebrovascular diseases. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Law. That was an uh, amazing demonstration of uh, how you can use both your microsurgical and endovascular expertise to uh, treat the patients. And I agree with your uh, uh, principle that it's the patient's uh, AVM or pathology, and it's not about what the surgeon can do or should do. Um, um, a couple of questions I had for you, um, especially with TCAR. Um, you know, the you know I I'm a big proponent of proximal protection because you know now you don't want to cross a heart lesion uh, to put in a distal protection. And uh, uh, when we started using MoMA, there's this MoMA uh, trial, which was uh, out from Japan, where you know the, the incidence of their stroke rates were in less than 1%, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not a randomized control trial. It's not a prospector trial like the Roadster trial, but we did achieve Roadster equivalent numbers just with proximal protection and mm -hmm. flow reversal. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if that is the case, do we really need to make an incision? Uh, especially in lesions that are in the bifurcation or post bifurcation. I completely mm -hmm. understand pre bifurcational lesions, you know, proximal lesions near osteal stenosis or arch pathology. We have to do retrograde, we have to come from the neck. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing a bifurcation or a distal lesion, do we really need to make a neck incision or can we just use proximal protection with flow reversal? Would that be enough? What's your thoughts on that? That's a great question. I think uh, if you can avoid it, uh, I think I think it makes sense. What I generally do, would, I would study the preoperative CTA very carefully. So if the CTA of the neck shows that there's an extensive aortic arch disease, that's a patient that I would really highly recommend uh, using TCAR to basically bypass all the aortic arch disease. But if patient with minimal aortic arch disease, you can, yes, argue to use uh, the other techniques to treat without doing an extra incision. Um, the, the second question I had, uh, you know, I really like your uh, uh, principles of embolizing AVM. I think it's loud and clear that we don't need to embolize every AVM that we see. Um, and the embolization for an AVM is, should be done 
by the surgeon or guided by a surgeon because the surgeon knows what is difficult for him and it's a targeted pedicle takedown right before the surgery, right? Uh, yeah. And I think uh, you explained that very well and you don't need to embolize the nidus if you're going to do a targeted pedicle takedown, all you need is a coil to reduce the flow. Um, and it also becomes a marker during surgery of where your coil is, so you know where your pedicle is. Yeah. Um, the, the one question I have, you know, normally when I do it, I kind of do it the night before, and then I take the patient AVM out in the day after. Of course, there's a little risk that there can be a hemorrhage or something like that because you alter the flow dynamics in the AVM. Um, but, you know, the reason why I do that that way is because then I can avoid anticoagulation when I'm doing an open surgery. So how do you handle that? How do you handle when you have an open head, when you're trying to put in a coil, uh, or do you anticoagulate these patients? How do you do that? Yeah, so I would uh, embolize them before I do the craniotomy. So I would, uh, you know, give them heparin bolus, uh, you know, check ACTs. And then uh, once I'm done with the embolization, then I would uh, reverse with protomy and then proceed with the craniotomy. Got it, got it. Um, the third question I had for you is, you know, from what I understand, you're doing most of your procedures in the hybrid OR, right? This is a regular angiography suite. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand that right and that comes mm -hmm. with uh, uh, um, a bigger you know you need a better prep you're in a sterile corridor doing cases in, in an angiography state which is a hybrid or is a very total different animal because you can be very faster in an angiography suite whereas you, you there's a lot of sterile restrictions and entry into an or mm -hmm. setting so um do you recommend doing all your procedures in the hybrid or or just take selected patients in the hybrid or and a follow-up to that, if you're taking selected patients to the hybrid OR, how would you justify cost and investment for an institution for a hybrid OR? Yes, uh, these are great questions. Um, so I, I do selective uh, because uh, as you mentioned that if, for patients that can be treated in just the regular dark plane or IL suite, it, things goes, gets, you know, goes a lot faster. And the images, uh, the quality of the images also also better. So I only use the hybrid OR if I, if I really have to. Um, in order to justify the cost, um, I think that it would be best to uh, work with the uh, you know, CV surgical colleagues or, or vascular surgeons, uh, because there's a strong need for pretty much, you know, a lot of things they do uh, require a hybrid, a hybrid room. So I think approaching them, you know, with three subspecialties pushing for this uh, utilization uh, would, be, uh, you know, would be reasonable. If you have any questions, uh from uh, Dr. Liu or Dr. Azam. Well, I have a question here. So, so, so sorry for the very noisy background. Yeah, I, I wanted to find out from Professor uh, regarding the evolution in cerebral vascular diseases. Uh, we, we know that the evolution in endovascular procedure was uh, very, very high uh, due to the commercial reason, uh, but very low in, in uh, micro uh, uh, surgery. Uh, by my, uh, by the neurosurgeon, would you think that uh, being a hybrid neurosurgeon, you will drive a higher uh, evolution in micro neurosurgery uh, for cerebral vascular disease? My first question. My second question, Professor, uh, as as a hybrid neurosurgeon uh, in the cerebral vascular diseases, uh, would 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 you be or would you be interested in other procedures such as a pre embolization of uh, skull based tumor, etc. Uh, uh, for that reason, and would, would that be helpful compared to other uh, general uh, endovascular uh, 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 intervention? Thank you, Professor. Uh, these are great questions, uh, and I probably we're gonna have you to uh, have you ask the first question again because I didn't catch the entire question. But in order to uh, answer your your second question, uh, I I do skull base as well. I, I did a skull base fellowship, and and I I don't typically embolize all my skull base uh, lesions uh, unless it's necessary uh, because some of these uh, solid skull base lesions you can get to the feeders uh, you know very quickly uh, for example you know people would argue oh maybe you should embolize a olfactory groove meningioma but but if you uh, you know do the approach you know uh, and get to the feeders right away then you know you can pretty much skip that part of embolization. That being said, I do think that there's a role. Uh, I just do it not to, I, I just don't do it for all my skull based tumors. Uh, and if I can uh, please uh, have you repeat the first question again. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. 
yeah, I'm sorry too. Uh, would, would you think that uh, as hybrid neurosurgeon, you will drive more evolution in microsurgical technique for cerebral vascular disease compared to a non-hybrid neurosurgeon? Professor, thank you. So are you, are you, uh, uh, do you mean that uh, there is a, uh, a push from the industry to evolve and develop the field? Is, is that what you're uh, thinking? Yeah, yeah. For example, now, now we can see that, especially for cerebral vascular, I mean, uh, uh, intracranial aneurysm, for example, uh, the evolution in terms of a, a different type of uh, uh, surgical clips, uh, for example, is yeah. not so high. And then mm -hmm. that probably limit uh, a lot of uh, uh, changes or outcome that we would see. Would you think that being a hybrid neurosurgeon and when you able to do a combined procedure, uh, would you think that you'll be able to drive uh, a higher uh, evolution in terms of techniques, surgical techniques or devices for micro neurosurgery mm -hmm. compared to a non-hybrid neurosurgeon? Thank you, Professor. Yeah, that, I think that's a great point. Uh, I, I think that's a good question. I, I, I agree with you. I think, I think that would be the case. And I have already myself seen some of that. Um, if you can, uh, you know, uh, the T car cases that I show you, initially T car was uh, designed to treat cervical carotid artery disease. And since I'm starting to use this to treat, you know, more intracranial, more distal, then uh, you know the the company will approach you, right, to to see if you can, you know, help them, you know, advance and, and push even further. Maybe conduct trials and and uh, and uh, you know so and so forth. So I, I think that there would be an industry push. Uh, if it's reasonable, I, I don't think that's a bad thing uh, because uh, you know, ultimately it's whatever we can do to help our patients, right? So uh, whether it is sponsored by industry or not, uh, I, I don't think uh, that would be the, the, the you know, top priority. But, but at the end of the day, if we can come up with a way to tr help our patients and with the support of industry, I, th I, think, that, uh, I think those two are not, uh, should not be in conflict. Thank, thank you, Professor. We have a Professor Tas, uh, Takashi Kon. Professor, uh, do you have any question from your side, Professor? Uh, thank, you for, uh, uh, thank you for the lecture. So uh, I'm Dr. Takashi Kon from Tokyo, Japan. And I, uh, I know the importance of hybrid neurosurgeon boards. So uh, do you use in the hybrid uh, OR, um, not only the T-car, um, uh, so low flow bypass and high high flow bypass are also needed in your OR uh, every time. And how is the uh, use of ICG, uh, interoperative ICG and in, uh, interoperative angiography uh, mm -hmm. also using? So how do you use, um, what, what uh, frequent, how frequency uh, do you use in uh, the interoperative angiography and the interoperative ICG? Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, I don't use the uh, hybrid OL. Um, on all my bypass cases, uh, mm -hmm. only in the selected one, especially mm -hmm. the high flow one. Those are the ones that I really want to be able to confirm and do an angiogram and troubleshoot if I, if I need to, uh, because the stakes are, are much higher. Uh, the STMCA usually, uh, those, uh, you know, let's say treating more and more disease, I think intraoperative ICG would be sufficient. I, I don't do those uh, in the hybrid OL uh, because mm -hmm. the success rate is extremely high, uh, potential complication is very low and ICG is going to be liable to detect the latency of the bypass. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Uh, 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 if there's no further question, we go back to Professor Samaresh for your closing uh, concluding remark, Professor. Um, uh, thank you for uh, the ACNS uh, team and Professor Cardo for organizing this. And Professor Law, that was a wonderful uh, talk. Uh, uh, it was my pleasure to introduce you um, and for all the panelists. Thank you uh, for spending time with us. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. And uh, uh, on, on, on with that, uh, I'm going to close uh, the uh, session on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the Professor, Professor Yoko Kato. I would like to thank both speakers for today, Professor Gastevo Pradila and Professor Lauzi Young. Uh, as well as the chairs of Professor Du Zhou Ying and Professor Sabaresh uh, Matarajan for the time and support for the SNS webinar. I would like also express my sincere gratitude to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. So until we meet again on Wednesday, it's bye-bye from all of us. Thank you, Professor, for joining. Thank you.